copy of Scripture. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14 tonight. And um, as we've done over the last several weeks, we've kind of been dealing with different questions about the Bible. Um, we're, we're talking about what is the Bible. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, can God speak to us? Why would God speak to us? Um, you know, do we have the right books of the Bible? How did we get it, the Bible? Is the Old Testament and New Testament hopelessly corrupted, or do we have the words of God? And tonight, we're going to deal with another objection. If they, so what I've been trying to do is kind of walk you through objections that people have to God's Word and Christianity. And, and these are very popular objections that, you know, pretty much any student that's going into a history of religion or, you know, comparative religions class or philosophy class is going to hear at college. You're, if you're watching Nat Geo or the History Channel, you're going to hear these things. Um, and tonight, one of the objections we're going to talk about is this, is that the story of Jesus that we find in the New Testament uh, was written way after he died. Um, you know, they don't, they don't contest the fact that he lived, but what they'll say is that all the stuff about him being God, him dying for our sins, him rising from the dead, all that came way, way later. Um, it was made up. And if that one doesn't stick, the next one that they say is that um, the story of Jesus that we get isn't really new to the New Testament. This isn't something brand new. It's something that got borrowed from other uh, pagan myths, uh, other pagan gods. And we'll kind of talk about those tonight. So as we always do, I want to kind of frame the argument for you, let you hear it from the other side, and then we'll kind of work through uh, the scriptures and work through um, different things to kind of work through and see what the evidence really shows. So here's one that talks about Jesus uh, from Deepak Chopra. Have you ever heard of Deepak Chopra? He was really big. Uh, he was on CNN a lot. He's kind of a spiritual psychologist kind of thing, but uh, this is what he says. I want to offer the possibility that Jesus was truly, as he proclaimed, a savior. Not the savior, not the one and only son of God. Rather, Jesus embodied the highest level of enlightenment. Jesus intended to save the world by showing others the path to God consciousness. Um, and so this is kind of the thing, that Jesus really isn't the savior of the world. He's not the one and only son of God. Uh, he's a good teacher. You know, he's a good moral person, somebody maybe we can emulate, but not somebody we need to worship. Um, our friend Bart Ehrman that we've talked a lot about, uh, he says, during his lifetime, Jesus didn't call himself God and didn't consider himself God, and none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. Now, that's the argument. They're going to say that nowhere in the New Testament did Jesus ever believe that he was God, ever say that he was God. Nobody else said that he was God. This was all invented afterwards. Um, this came up later, um, and so we're going to talk about that. Um, and one of the things that I want to deal with is there's a, a belief that says there's no evidence of a belief in a dying and rising Messiah in Judaism and early Christianity. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Reza, Reza Aslan. He's written some books about Jesus. And here's what he says. Despite two millennia of Christian apologetics, the fact is that belief in a dying and rising Messiah simply did not exist in Judaism. In the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, there is not a single passage of scripture or prophecy about the promised Messiah that even hints of his ignominious death, let alone his bodily resurrection. Now, unfortunately for Reza, he hasn't read the Old Testament because there are a lot of prophecies about his death and resurrection, and we're going to get into those in just a minute. Um, but this is the argument that they'll put out, that the story of Jesus that we have has been invented, or the story of Jesus that we have has been borrowed from these other things. So... Is this, is this true? How does the biblical prophecy stack up against other prophecies? Now, we are going to get to Mark in just a minute, but I wanted to give you this information before we get there to frame the discussion. So is, is this a true claim? How does biblical prophecy stand, stack up against other prophecy? Well, there are other prophecies out there. And one of the things that you need to understand is that the biblical prophecy is more detailed than the Matrix and Nostradamus. Now, I know those are kind of silly, but I'm, I'm using those because these are the things that people go to, like the movie The Matrix. Uh, in the movie The Matrix, there was a prophecy about, you know, the main character being the one, but it was very ambiguous. And so all throughout the movie, people are doubting it and saying, well, I don't believe in it, and it's too, you know, too ambiguous. And then we get Nostradamus, and he's the biggest one that people go to with prophecy, and we're going to look at some of his stuff in just a minute. Um, he made lots of predictions. He made lots of prophecies. And so you're going to see kind of how the Bible stacks up against these kind of prophecies. Now, I want to share this with you, and this is pretty cool information. There was a book written um, by Peter Stoner. It's called Science Speaks, and he talks about the probability of um, prophecies in the Old Testament and someone fulfilling those. So let me give you this. The Old Testament contains 300 prophecies about the Messiah. 
The Old Testament contains 300 prophecies about the Messiah, and they're very detailed, and we're going to work through those and just, we're not going to do all 300, but I'm going to give you a good, good swath of stuff that you're going to see. Um, but it contains 300 prophecies about the Messiah. Now, one of the questions that always comes up are, what are the chances of someone fulfilling all 300 of those prophecies? Because here's what people like to tell you. Okay, well, you know, the prophecies in the Old Testament, they're, they're kind of generic like these other prophecies, and so anybody could kind of figure that out and work it out. Well, it's not true. Um, as you'll see, the prophecies in the Old Testament are very specific. There's cities, there's dates, there's all sorts of different things that are very down to the detail that, you know, that are outside of people's control. But this Peter Stoner, he put a book together and he said, what's the probability of someone fulfilling all 300 prophecies in the Old Testament of who the Messiah is? And here's what it is. One to the 10th to the 17th power. I don't even know what that number is. I can't even tell you what that is. That's a lot of zeros. So when you see that many zeros, what, what does that mean? It's a lot. Well, let, me do a, let me do a better... Huh? It's a mathematical improbability. Let me give you a better illustration that may do this. He said, so we're going to make it easier. Instead of all 300, let's take eight. Let's take eight of prophecy, eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament. What's the probability of someone doing that? He said, the probability would be like take Texas and fill Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. Take one of those silver dollars and mark an X on it. Throw it into Texas and swirl all the stuff around. Blindfold somebody and let them go around and pick that's the probability. Now, here's the reality. Jesus fulfills all 300 of these Old Testament prophecies. And the only reason he can do that is because it's, divine, it's divinely, you know, uh, guided, okay? So, before we talk about the prophecies in the Old Testament, I want to give you a little taste of Nostradamus um, and see if you can help me figure out what prophecy he's making. This is a prediction he made, and see if you can figure out if it's been fulfilled. This is the first one. Near the gates and within two cities, there will be scourges, the like of which was never seen, famine within plague, people put out by steel, crying to the great immortal God for relief. Anybody want to take a stab? Not the Twin Towers. Anybody want to take a stab? Good, good, good guess. No? I'll tell you. Atomic bomb, a Hiroshima. That, they say, well, that, it's cl it clearly means that, right? <laughs> okay. So you're not convinced. Let me give you another one. The blood of the just will commit a fault at London. Burnt through the lightning of 23s, the six, the ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. <laughs> Take a guess what that is. Anybody? It's the fire in London. Now, here's the problem. The fire in London was not caused by lightning. It was someone who left a burner on it too long, and it burnt down that building and all the other buildings around it. Um, there was no ancient lady that fell. They'll say, oh, no, it was the ancient lady was London herself because the city burned. Um, and, you know, they, there were lots of people killed, but so none of that came true. One more. <clears throat> the great man will be struck down in the day by a thunderbolt, an evil deed foretold by the bearer of a petition. According to the prediction, another falls at nighttime, conflict at Rheims, London, and a pestilence in Tuscany. No. Nope. Good guess, though. Anybody? No. Nope. The assassination of John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. So he wasn't struck by a thunderbolt. Um, there were nothing else that happened in Rheims, London, or a pestilence in Tuscany during the time of their deaths. So here's the thing. I, wanna, I wanted to put these out here for a reason. I want you to understand that biblical prophecy is not like that, okay? Biblical prophecy isn't this weird kind of stuff put together that doesn't make any sense, and then bunches of years later, you can come back and go, oh, yeah, it's the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Huh? What? <laughs> So what happens is in biblical prophecy, and this, and this directly con, uh, contradicts Reza Eslon, that there was a belief in a dying and rising Messiah. And in the Old Testament, there's 300 prophecies about the Messiah, and it narrows down this address to one person. There's only one person who can fulfill all these things. And like I said, I'm not going to do all 300, but I want to just show you what does the Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy look like. 
Well, first of all, here's what we get. Born of a woman, born of a virgin. Very clearly in Genesis 3.15 and Isaiah 7.14, if you read those scriptures, it'll say in Genesis 3.15 is that he was going to be of the seed of a woman, not the seed of man. Isaiah 7.14, the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a child. Now that starts to narrow things down very, very quickly, doesn't it? I mean, we don't know too many people who have not been born without an earthly father, you know, a virgin birth. And so it kind of narrows that down, takes it down really big. And then the next one is, the Messiah will be both God and man. In Psalm 2.2, 2, Psalm 2.7, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14, 1 Chronicles 17, 13. In each one of those situations, it very clearly says the Messiah who's coming is going to be both God and man. Pretty awesome. Narrows that address down even more. <clears throat> He'll be a descendant of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, it says, In Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And it's that same idea of, in Genesis chapter 3, the same seed, right? But even the, the, the funnier thing is, as you go through the Old Testament, and this is where I'm not going to put all this stuff in there, it narrows it down to Isaac and Jacob and, you know, all the way down to David. You just see that lineage. He says, no, it's not just Abraham, but it's this one. It's this son and then this son and this son and this son, all the way down to David. His birthplace this is a pretty awesome one. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says that the king of kings, the ruler, is going to be born in Bethlehem. Great. You can go read it for yourself. Now think about this. That rules out every other town on the face of the earth where the Messiah could be born. Nowhere else but in Bethlehem. Here's another one. The temple will still be standing when he comes. Malachi 3.1. That when the Messiah comes, when he shows up and he appears in Jerusalem, the temple will still be standing. When Jesus was born, guess where he went when he was eight days old? The temple. Um, guess where he was when he was 12 years old and he got left by mom and dad? The temple. Where did he teach and preach a lot of times when he was teaching and preaching? At the temple. Okay. But that narrows the time frame down even more. He will perform amazing miracles. Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. Uh, he will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah, set, uh, Zechariah 9, 9. Think about that. How weird of a detail is it to say that the king of kings, the Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that the king is, when he comes to Jerusalem, he's going to come in riding on the foal of a donkey. And then we get that fulfillment in the New Testament where Jesus does that on Palm Sunday. He's been betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver, Psalm 41, 9, Zechariah 11, uh, 12 through 13. His revealing and death clearly given a date. Now, this one's pretty awesome, and I, I didn't know this for a long time, but in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 26, it talks about uh, when Messiah is going to come. And it talks about all these things, all these kingdoms that have to come, and all these thing, kingdoms that are going to fall. And then when the, when, when the Israelites are going back to Jerusalem, then, then there's a certain time period. And it's actually... Um, 173,888 day, 880 days after Israel is told to go back. And this is King Cyrus in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. They're told to go back and rebuild and start over again. It says 173,880 days, then Messiah would show up. Now, the craziest thing is this. When you run that out, that is Palm Sunday when Jesus walks into Jerusalem. That's Old Testament, man. That's right there. The decree came out March 5th of 444 BC, and Jesus walked in uh, Palm Sunday, March 30th of 33 AD. Or it wasn't AD at that point, but 33. So, but 173,888 days. That's Old Testament. His crucifixion, his piercing, his mocking, casting of lots, all of that was prophesied in Psalm 22, 6 through 18, and Zechariah 12, 10. In fact, the prophecy about Jesus' crucifixion in Psalm 22 was the oldest prophecy that we have about the Messiah. It was 800 years before Christ came, and this was uh, before uh, Romans ever used anything called crucifixion. Um, and so when we look in Psalm 22, it talks about his hands and his feet will be pierced. Uh, it talks about crucifixion and his death. But that's in Psalm 22. And then, last but not least, he will die, but he'll be resurrected. Psalm 16, 9 through 11, Psalm 22, 25 through 27, Isaiah 53, 8 through 10, Hosea 6, 2, and Zechariah 12, 10. Now, 
that is not all 300 of the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's just a snapshot. But when you take just those, it narrows down the field of who possibly could be the Messiah to one person, and that's Jesus. And so one of the things that we need to look at and understand when people say, because again, we talk about this, they just say this stuff, they put it out there hoping and knowing that you're not going to do any research because they have letters after their name and they say that they study the Bible or they're archaeologists or they're this or they're that or whatever they are. You just assume that they know what they're talking about. And so this, this guy that we quoted just a few minutes ago said, there's no evidence of that. Really? Seems to be some evidence of that. You know? And so the, the issue is, is that we need to understand that when, when people make these claims, we need to stop, take a breath, and say, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Let me, let me check that out. So here's evidence that there was an understanding of a death of a resurrection, of a Messiah, that he was God. I mean, there's all these things that they say was made up well after Jesus was born. It seems like it was made up well before he was born. And God put that address in the Old Testament so that we would know. Now, I wanted to present something to you from Scripture today that I, I find very compelling. Um, one of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible gives contrary evidence. And so what we're going to find today is the trial of Jesus. Jesus is on trial and we're going to read about that, and we're going to talk about that, and how that applies to these arguments that all this stuff was made up after he died, right? So we, we, we hear that Jesus didn't consider himself God, his disciples didn't consider him God, nobody considered him God, okay? Let's look in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were given, hey, Ron, I've got a bad feedback. Can you fix that for me? For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent, and he did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Now, <clears throat> Jesus was put on trial for blasphemy. Now, it's important to understand why he was put on trial for blasphemy and what that means, okay? So let me give you a definition here. Uh, why is it so important that Jesus was on trial for blasphemy? Well, blasphemy is an act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God. And let me say it this way. One of the things that they held blasphemy out for at that time was equating yourself with God. Uh, one of the things that they hated Jesus for is Jesus very clearly said in his teaching that he was one with God, he was equal with God, that he was God. And so they're bringing this trial of blasphemy against him because here's what they're saying. You can't be God. We know you're not God. And so you're blaspheming God by saying that you are God. And they've put him on trial to do that. Well, here's the thing. What did Jesus believe about himself? Now, he doesn't defend himself in this trial. In fact, in just a minute, we're going to go through his response. But um, he doesn't give any evidence. He doesn't give any witnesses. But here's the thing. What got Jesus into this trial of blasphemy? Well, here's the first thing. Jesus believed himself to be God and claimed that openly. You read so many times in the Gospels where Jesus says something, he heals somebody, he performs a miracle, and the Pharisees are like, we need to kill him now. We need to stone him, push him off a cliff, do something. And the reason they did that, because Jesus believed himself to be God and openly claimed that he was God. <clears throat> so here's what we see in the New Testament. <laughs> Jesus claimed he was God. Matthew 23, 34, Matthew 27, 43, Luke 22, 70. In all of these instances, Jesus claims to be God. And he does that by different things, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but he does that through the way that he teaches the way that he heals, and, and some of the other things that he was doing. Now, he didn't just claim to be God. He believed he was equal with God, John 5, 23. 
And this really set them off. They, they really hated this idea. They hated the fact that he claimed to be God, and then they hated the fact that he would say he is on par with God, that he's equal with God. And then this third one, this is the trinity of stuff that they got mad about. Jesus believed he was one with God. John 10, 30, that famous passage where Jesus talks about that we cannot be snatched out of his father's hands, and then he says, I and the father are one. Not only am I God, not only am I equal to God, but God and I are one. In fact, in John 14, 7, we hear just a few chapters later where, um, you know, one person just, you know, famously after Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me. And they said, just show us the way. We don't know the way. And if you just show us the Father, that'd be enough. And he would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? So why is Jesus on trial for blasphemy? Because he believed himself to be God and claimed that openly, and they knew that. And so they put him on trial for that. But he also believed he performed miracles by his power as God. Now, there was a lot of confusion around Jesus as he's doing miracles. Uh, think about the time where, you know, he uh, heals a blind man and they ask him, how do you do this? By what power did you do this? And he would say, well, by what power did, you know, your prophets do that? And they're like, well, we've, if we say by God, he's going to say, I did it by God, you know. Um, there were other times when they said he heals the sick and he cast out demons by the power of the devil. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> Jesus clearly believed and taught that he performed miracles by his, by his power as God. And so one of the ways he did that was the authority to forgive sins. Mark 2, 7 through 12. This is the story of the paralytic guy who gets lowered down while Jesus is speaking. And Jesus has this conversation with the Pharisees because they know he's about to heal the guy. And they're upset that he's about to heal the guy. And he says, hey, which one's harder? To say your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk? And he says, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins. Because he already told the guy, get up, your sins are forgiven. And they got mad at him. Who? Only God can forgive. And so he says, Look, what's harder? To say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? And he says, to show you I have the authority to, to, to forgive sins, he says, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he did. And so Jesus says, hey, I, I can do that because I'm God. He believed he performed miracles by his powers of God, and it was his authority to interpret the law. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. Um, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard it said, finish it. But I say to you, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus believed that he had the power to interpret and basically reapply the law. In fact, what he was doing is he was tearing down all the Pharisees' understanding of the law and all their extra commandments they put on top of the Ten Commandments. He's saying, all that's bunk. When he, when he said, you've heard it said, what he's saying is, the Pharisees in the crowd have told you, but they're wrong. Let me tell you. And so he shows his power and authority by interpreting the law. He shows he's God by the power to control the weather. I talked about this on Sunday, but in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, um, Jesus does an assortment of miracles all back to back. He heals a demon-possessed demon guy. A guy was possessed by a bunch of demons, and he, he casts them out. And then he gets in the boat, and there's the storm, and he calms the storm with a word. And then they get over, and he you know, heals uh, a little girl who you know, uh, had sickness. I mean, he does all of these things right there together. And so he shows he's God because he has the power to control the weather. He has the power to do all that. And then he has power over disease, death, and demons. Mark chapter 5 and John chapter 11. The funniest thing about this is that Jesus is on trial for all of these things. And we're going to get into this in just a minute. But Jesus is on trial because the, 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 the Pharisees understood who Jesus thought he was, understood the power that he thought he had, and listened to the words that he said. And that's why he's on trial for blasphemy. They didn't believe, but they, they knew he did. And so here it is. He believed himself to be God and claimed that openly. So he did that by performing miracles. But also, Jesus allowed others to believe and call him God. So if there's this narrative that's really true, that you know, Jesus never believed himself to be God and his disciples never believed himself to be God, there's a lot of awkward things that happen in Scripture, right? Right? Uh, Jesus performs a miracle, they fall down at his feet and worship him, call him God. 
And he doesn't say, no, 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 don't do that. Because you see angels doing that. Like angels show up in scripture and they do amazing things and people fall down. They're like, no, 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 I'm not God. You don't see Jesus doing that. There, now in Mark, you do see him telling people to be quiet and not share what they know. But he never says, no, I'm not God, right? So he allows people to believe and call him God. <clears throat> Jesus accepted worship as God. Matthew 14, 33, Matthew 28, 9. He accepts worship when people, you know, thank him and they praise him and they bless him and they, you know, all those kind of things. He doesn't say, no, I'm not God. Don't do that. He accepts that worship. <clears throat> and Jesus led people to believe that he was the Messiah. Matthew 21, 9. The most famous is when, you know, John the Baptist says, are you the one or should we expect someone else? And Jesus quotes from a portion of Isaiah 35 to show him, yes, I am the Messiah. And so he let people openly worship him and believe that he was God. Here's one that I love. People who weren't his followers believed him to be God. So here, here are people who weren't following him, didn't listen to him preach, but they interacted with him and they came to believe that he was God. One of the most famous ones, a Roman centurion believed him to be God, Matthew 27, 54. Do you remember that story? Jesus on the cross, and he's, you know, breathed his last breath, and, you know, the, the earth opens, and the sky is black, and then the Roman centurion says, surely this must be the Son of God. I think this is great testimony, too. Demons believed him to be God, and they confessed that. Matthew 8, 29, Luke 4, 41, and Mark 3, 11. Every time that a demon-possessed person met Jesus, they would say, Son of man, Son of God, what do you have to do with us? Don't send us away into perdition. Don't send us away into judgment. They recognized who he was. So one of the things you need to see here is that Jesus is on trial for blasphemy. Now, it would only be blasphemy if it wasn't true, right? But here's the problem. They could bring no evidence that showed that what he said, what he taught, and what he was doing was wrong. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So any questions about that real quick? So this idea that all this stuff was created after Jesus was gone, that there wasn't this happening when he was around, doesn't make any sense. How many times did you hear in the gospel when Jesus would do a miracle and they would say, who is this guy? I, I, I thought he was Joseph's kid. Like, isn't he the carpenter's son? Like, what's going on with this? And then, you know, they would say, well, oh, no, he, you know, he's, he could be the, the son of David. He's the Messiah. There was all that going on while he was there. But he believed it, his disciples believed it, and many others came to believe it after seeing him. So, as we looked at the trial, what's the evidence that was brought against him? Well, let's look at that. So, if Jesus really didn't believe he was God, it should be easy to convict him of blasphemy, right? It should be easy. Well, look at verse 55. Chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. Now, I just gave you plenty of testimony where Jesus had clearly said over and over and over again that he was God, where Jesus had clearly taught he was equal with God, he was one with God, where Jesus had exercised power and authority and said, I'm doing this because I'm God. So here's the problem. They, they don't have any evidence. What does that mean? Well, they have no evidence to show to the contrary that he's not God. And even this, look at what they do. Verse 56, for many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, we've heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. So, the prosecution was found to suborn perjury. So here it is. They want to charge Jesus with blasphemy to say he's not God. They want to charge him with doing acts and teaching things that were an offense to God because he was saying he was equal with God, he was one with God. And so they start bringing in all these witnesses that had actually paid themselves. They, they brought these people in. They kind of gave them the story they wanted them to stick to. And they show up and they start giving testimony and none of their testimony corroborated each other. Now I want you to think about that for a second. How awesome does your life have to be where nobody can convict you of anything? I mean, 
I could be convicted of a lot of stuff, you know? But yet here they are, and, and, and like they had set the whole thing up, right? They had false witnesses that were coming in willing to lie, even though lying in their court was worthy of death. Perjury was given the death penalty. So not only were they asking for perjury, and they were giving perjury, but their perjury was so much they couldn't even get the stories together to convict him because his life was so amazing. So here's what happened. They wanted and needed a confession from him. They were not going to be able to convict him of blasphemy, even though they had mounds and mounds of evidence. They weren't going to be able to convict him, so they needed a confession. And look what the high priest does. Verse 60, high priest stood up, came forward, and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Now, basically, you know, he's saying, what's your answer to all these accusations they're making? Well, when you have the truth and you're innocent, you, you don't have to answer those objections. And Jesus didn't. He didn't answer any of those things because it was all false, it was all ridiculous, and everybody saw it. And so it says, um, he kept silent and didn't answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Now here it is. You know, he understands that they can't convict him because they have no evidence. They can't show that he has, you know, misapplied the law. They can't show that he's broken the law. They can't show that anything he said and done is an offense to God because God seems to be blessing everything he says and does. In fact, they'd never seen the kind of miracles that were happening in their midst except when God shows up. And so they had no evidence. And so he puts them on the spot. I'm going to ask you a direct question. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Now, do you you hear the title that he gives him? There's two titles here. Are you the Christ is the first one. Are you the Messiah? Are you the expected one? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? And then, are you the son of the blessed one? Are you the son of man? Are you the son of God? These are both Old Testament terms that are kind of used interchangeably about the Messiah who would be coming. And so Jesus' response, I want you to listen to this. The first thing that Jesus says is, I am. Now, you think, well, that's cool. He just says, I am. But but you got to know your Old Testament history. He's using a a very pointed response there. Do you remember what God said his name was to Moses? I am. When Jesus looks at them, he doesn't say, yes, you are correct. He says, I am. And then to just make it even further, he says, he quotes Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 and 14. He quotes it and says, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So he does this twofold response here. He gives the personal name of God. That's his first answer, Yahweh. He says, yeah, Yahweh, I am. And then the second answer he gives is not only am I God, but I am the Messiah. I'm exactly who you believe me to be. And he says, I am the son of man. Now in the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, 13 and 14 talks about this scene where Daniel sees the Messiah, the coming one, and he walks into the throne room of the Ancient of the Days. It says, I see a throne, and on the throne, the Ancient of Days is sitting there, and one who looks like the Son of Man walks in to the throne room, up to the throne, and God gives him glory and dominion and power and, you know, praise forever and ever. Amen. Right? Now, think about this. Who is allowed in God's presence? Nobody, right? Nobody can walk into God's presence, just walk in. So this has to be somebody on par with God, equal with God. In fact, you you see this by the way that God treats the Son of Man. He gives him glory and power and dominion and all those kind of things that are only God's. Think about in the Old Testament, who does God share his glory with? Nobody. Who does God share his power with? nobody. So this person has to be somebody pretty special, right? Well, to the Jews, this was the Messiah. This is the one that's going to come and he's going to change everything and he's going to turn everything around and he's going to save them. So what is the answer that Jesus gives them? Yeah, I am God and I am the Messiah. Well, I wish that we had a different response here, but look at the response. Verse 63, tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? 
Now, this isn't something that we normally do, and so sometimes this stuff doesn't make sense. But when he tears his clothes, it's a sign of mourning, grief, that something so horrible and so terrible has come. The only way that you can show that accurately of what's going on on the inside is you have to do something on the outside. Now, generally, what they would do is they would tear their clothes, and they would find ashes, and they'd dump ashes on themselves to show that they're in mourning. And he doesn't do that here. But what happens is when Jesus says, I am, and I'm the son of man, he says, do we need any other witnesses? Do you get what he's saying here? He's just convicted himself. But here's the problem. Yeah, he has convicted himself of being God, not of blasphemy. Yeah, he has convicted himself of being God and, and having power and authority and all the things that he said he did. Yeah, and so the guy tears his clothes, and, and basically they, he says, okay, what, what do you want to do? And verse six, 64, you have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. So where was the blasphemy? Remember, blasphemy is an act it was an offense. It was speaking against God in a wrong way or claiming to be God when you're not, claiming to speak from God when you don't. But here's their verdict. The verdict against him, he was guilty of blasphemy. Now, here's why I bring this up, and I want to use this with this understanding of Jesus' story being made up. When they say, oh, no, no, Jesus never believed himself to be God. His disciples never believed himself to be God. Nobody else did. What, what does this say? He's been convicted of blasphemy. Why? Because he believed he was God. And here's the thing that I love. They didn't believe he was God, but they sure did believe he believed he was God. <laughs> did you catch that? They didn't believe he was God, but they sure did believe that he believed he was God. That's why he's on trial. That's why he was convicted of blasphemy. And so here's the thing, when, when we come to these things, and you'll, you know, I was watching several things today, I wanted to show some video clips, but it just kind of, they're too long and we couldn't get into all the stuff, but I was watching a National Geographic uh, thing and they were talking about this very thing and basically they were just spouting off all the nonsense I was telling you before. Jesus never believed he was God. His disciples never believed he was God. Nobody in the Jewish community believed he was God. There's no evidence of that anywhere. I mean, what about the 300 prophecies in the Old Testament? What about all the stuff that he was doing in the New Testament? Like, they just throw all that out. So, here's the thing. And this is just a small snippet of stuff that I could give you, but I wanted to go to this, his trial, because this, to me, is, is very powerful stuff that we can share with people and say, look, he was convicted of blasphemy because he believed he was God. He taught he was God. He lived as if he was God. And... I didn't include this in your handout, but it's one of my favorite quotes that I go back to a lot. One of the things we have to help people understand is Jesus doesn't give us an option on who we think he is. We don't get to choose. Um, there, Jesus has had more written, books written about him than any other person, and I'm glad because he's, a, he's the, the best subject of any book. But here's the problem. When you go and start looking through these, here's what you'll hear about Jesus. Um, he was a revolutionary. He was a peasant. He really wasn't, you know, the, the son of God. He was a peasant who they kind of attached this narrative to. He was a carpenter. Um, he was, you know, um, he was a, a reactionary to the government. He fought against the government. Um, he was a great moral teacher. He was a sage or a guru, you know. He was a great ethical man. But he wasn't God. And here's the problem. C.S. Lewis puts it very beautifully um, C.S. Lewis basically says that Jesus does not give us the option of saying he's a good moral teacher. Doesn't give us the option of talking about his ethics or, you know, any of those kind of things. There's only three options. He's either Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. And he said, so you have to work through these options. He's either a liar knowing that everything that he is saying is completely false. And so you would put him on the level of the devil of hell that he's going around knowingly telling people that he's God and letting them worship him and letting them do all this kind of stuff when he's not. He's either a liar or he's Lord. Or he's a lunatic. Um, and I love the example that C.S. Lewis used. He said it's kind of like the guy in the mental hospital who thinks he's a poached egg <laughs> or, or Napoleon, 
right? That, that, that Jesus legit had serious mental issues. And because of that, we kind of go, hey, sorry, man, that's just, you know. But then if that's really true, if he's a lunatic, then why would we listen to any of his teachings? Why would we follow them? Or the only clear option is he's the Lord who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our surrendering our lives to him. And so that's what we fundamentally come to here is that he's convicted of blasphemy, not because he did anything wrong, but because he was right. They convicted him of being God, which was right. So I want to hit real quick in the time we have left. There's been a new thing that's come out, and it's actually not new. It's kind of been around for a long time, but it's just kind of game steam again along with this kind of thing that the story of Jesus isn't new to the New Testament. It's actually borrowed from Egyptian, uh, Greece, and Roman myths about other gods. And so we want to answer that question. Is Jesus's life story borrowed from other myths? Well, there are similar stories of other gods coming out of Egypt, Greek, uh, Greek and Roman mythology. Now, here's the problem. Uh, you can pull these videos up on YouTube. There's even a movie out about it. Uh, you can watch it. And so they're just going to throw a bunch of information at you. And here's what they're going to say. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to pick uh, three of the gods that, that they deal with, Mithras, Dionysus, and Horus. Um, Mithras was a guy who lived in kind of Mesopotamia. He was uh, kind of a priest, and they, there's some things about him. Dionysus is a, a Greek and Roman uh, god, and then Horus is an Egyptian god. And here's what they'll say. Um, I, I want to talk to you about a god that I worship who was born on December 25th by a virgin, uh, he lived a sinless and perfect life, and he taught, and he had 12 disciples who followed him. Uh, he was crucified between two thieves, and he rose again on the third day. Who am I talking about? Well, we'd say Jesus, and they're like, you're wrong. <laughs> we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about guys that are much older than Jesus. There were, the, there were the messiahs that were around before Jesus, and so that guy that I'm talking about is Mithras or Dionysus or Horus. And, and this has become a big thing. You'll, you'll see this in comparative religions. They're teaching it on college campuses that, you know, they're trying to show kids, hey, don't believe in Jesus. This is just nonsense. It's been around for a long time. Here's the problem. None of that's, none of that's true. None of that's true. And so I want to just take three sections out of Jesus's life and compare the stories with what these guys come up with and see if they fit. So do the stories do these stories of these guys match the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Because they say that they do. They overlap perfectly. And so the Christians must have robbed this, must have stolen it, must have borrowed it. And so they made this up, right? All right, virgin birth. Were all of these gods virgin born? Now, I just want to be up front and tell you that some of the things I got to share with you are kind of scandalous a little bit because these people are nut jobs. And so I just got to tell you that <laughs> up front, okay? Just up front. Were these gods virgin born? Well, Mithras, he came out of rocks that were under a sacred tree next to a riverbank. <laughs> so I guess the definition of virgin born, you kind of have to ask, what does that mean? You know, um, he had no dad. He had no mom. He came out of a rock. Um, and I, I don't know the sexual status of rocks. So, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, Dionysus. Dionysus was created by incest between Zeus and one of his daughter gods. So she was not a virgin. He came out of a sexual relationship between a father and a daughter, okay? Does that sound like Jesus? No, no. Horus, now this is where it gets bad. Horus, uh, his mother impregnated herself with recreated genitals of her husband. So let me share this story with you. Um, <laughs> Her husband gets chopped up in about 15 pieces, and one of those pieces being his genitals, and the pieces get scattered. A fish eats his genitals, and the mother is upset, and she wants to have a child, so she sculpts a new genital and has sex with that, and that's what creates Horus. Do what? That is a horrible story. So... So does any of that sound like Jesus' story? No. But again, they just throw all this stuff out, and they're like, oh, you're not going to check it, you know? And so they compile it. I actually watched a video, and they had, like, they had the scary music and everything. I mean, like, super was like, ooh. And they would just, you know, roll these little facts down. And I'm like, ooh, that is scary, you know? 
So, virgin born, let's, let's click that off. How about, did all of these gods die to save their people from their sins? Because they say they die on a cross, they died a sacrificial death, they died for the sins of their people. Well, let, let's look that up. Um, Mithras did not die. Um, there was never recorded in any of the history of Mithras that he died. In fact, um, he was adopted by the Roman army as their kind of um, symbol and bearer. He's called the invincible sun god. So he didn't die, and he didn't die for people. So no sacrificial death for Mithras. Uh, Dionysus, um, he was attacked while looking in a mirror at himself. Um, he, uh, he, he was so enamored with himself that he couldn't look away, and he was attacked by his rivals and what happened is to get away from them, he would shapeshift. And so he would shapeshift into different things, and he shapeshifted into a bull, and they caught him in a bull, and they cut him into pieces. That's how he died, okay? And then Horus, he didn't die either. He merged with Ra, the sun god. Don't really know how that happened, but they just kind of came together and <laughs> became this super god, you know? It's like Wonder Twins, you know, they connected... Some of you got that, some of you didn't. That's okay. So, so here's the thing. None of these guys or any of the other ones that they like to pull out from ancient Egypt or Greek, uh, Greece or Rome, um, none of them die sacrificially for people. In fact, they don't die on a cross, right? So did these gods have a resurrection myth that resembles Jesus? Did they, you know, they all talked about they died and they rose again, right? So let's see. Mithras. Well, no death means what? No, no resurrection, so that one's out. Um, Dionysus, he has five different stories of how he resurrected. Um, let's, let's look at one. Of, oh, I don't have all of them. Anyway, so here's the stories as I remember them. The first one is he's cut into, his, cut into pieces. His mother comes, and she sews him back together. And once he's sewn back together, he comes back to life. Uh, that's story one. Story two is after he was cut into pieces, he ascended into heaven and you know, it was able to be brought back alive that way. The third story is uh, Zeus swallows his heart. And when Zeus swallows his heart, that brought him back. Uh, number four was that, he, um, that Zeus swallowed his heart and then spit it back up and created a potion out of his heart and fed it to one of his other daughters, and his daughter became pregnant with Dionysus, and he was reborn that way. And then the last story is, is that when he was cut into pieces, six months out of the year, he lives in the underworld, and six months out of the year, he lives in the upper world. And so that's where we get this, Dionysus is kind of the change of the seasons, he's the fertility kind of God, and so you have the dying and rising with the seasons. So five stories there, um, none of them a real resurrection, really, you know. Um, and then we have Horus. Horus, after he connects with Ra, the sun god, he's reborn every day when the sun rises. So, what are we to make of these myths and the story of Jesus? None of the source material matches the claims that are made. So here's the deal. And I'm not just saying this on my own authority. People a lot smarter than me have researched this. And I, I wanted to show you a video clip, but again, it just it was too long. I may do it another time. Uh, William Lane Craig, uh, he's a great apologist, philosopher, theologian. Um, he's Christian, and he gets asked this question all the time. And there's a video of him. You can Google it. Uh, go on YouTube and look it up. William Lane Craig, you know, Jesus and Horace. And the student gets up and basically says, well, you know, I'm a history major and I know about Horus and I know about Osiris and I know about all these. And, and basically William Lane Craig is like, yeah, anybody that really knows history knows that's all been debunked. And, and here's the thing, the, the, the problem that I have with this is they, they, they're putting stuff out there that has been dealt with over and over and over and over again, but the, large, the, the public at large doesn't know it. Any real historical scholar is not going to say that Jesus of the Bible and Horus or Dionysus or, you know, Mithras are the same person or their stories are the same. They're not going to say, even Bart Ehrman says, no, nah. and, and we know how Bart is, right? Even he says no. And so, so the thing that bothers me about this is they're being disingenuous when they're sharing this as evidence. They know it's not factual. And so 
he gives this great thing, and he basically just says, look, all of this stuff, if you go back to the original documents, and they, they don't, it doesn't say that. There's nothing in there about them being crucified or being born on a certain date or being virgin born. I mean, we went through, through this. I mean, I just pulled this stuff from the source material, okay? So none of these source material matches the claims that are made. And here's the thing. None of the source material that they go back to reads like the gospel accounts. What do you mean by that? Well, let's just look. Let's flip back to Matthew chapter 1. Actually, let's do, let's do Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And we're going to read that one verse. What, what do we learn in that one verse? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Who was king at the time Jesus was born? Herod. Did you catch that? historical facts that you can check. Um, you know, we can't check out a story about somebody who recreates genitals to be impregnated. I'm, I'm just saying, right? You know, when you, but when you read these accounts and you go back, there's nothing to go back and check, you know? In, in fact, when, when we find out about the, in Luke chapter, well, let's look at Luke. This is great to see that to, here too. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the census be taken of the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph went from Galilee to the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David. What do we find out there? What, what brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem? <laughs> Yeah, government, census. There's a census, but not just any census. Who was emperor at the time? Caesar Augustus. Who was governor at the time? <laughs> Quirinius, yeah, try it. Yeah, you can try to say it. Nobody knows what he's, how to say it. But here's the thing. When we read the gospel accounts, they don't read like myths. They don't, they don't read like Jason and the Argonauts. They don't read like the Iliad and the Odyssey. They don't read like that. What we get is we get cities and we get towns and we get time frames that you can go back and check. And here's the deal, guys. Here, you can say this with full confidence. When, when archaeology goes and they find things, they do nothing but back up the, the scripture. Okay? And so this other source material that they're looking at never reads like what the gospel does. In fact, one of my favorite things, and I'll just read it to you. Um, you don't have to turn there. Is the beginning of the gospel of Luke. This is what Luke says. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you've been taught. I mean, you hear what, you hear what Luke's saying? I've, inv I've investigated this. I've interviewed eyewitnesses. I've checked this out. And I want to write it down in consecutive order so that you can trust what you've been taught. So, none of the myths show the same concern for human well-being. I, I didn't get into this when we were going through there, but I want to take just a minute on this, and, and I want you to see this. It's so funny that people who lump Jesus and God in with these pagan gods um, have no problem with what the pagan gods did. If you go back and read the creation accounts of how the world came into being in any of these other pagan religions, humans were not high on the list. They were always a byproduct. It was something that kind of happened by accident. Gods didn't really want us, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and and the, God, the only reason that humans even come about in these things are you know, for the gods' pleasure and for their whims. And so the gods play us like pawns and they have sex with us whenever they choose to and they punish us however they want to and they just use us for their whims and their pleasure. And yet the Bible comes along and we see a God who's personal 
and he loves us, and he creates us in his image. No human being in any other pagan religion is created in the image of the gods, only in Christianity. He's involved in our life. He provides for us. He protects us. He's there for us. They, they don't care. The only time that the other pagan gods have anything to do with humanity is if humanity can do something for them. Oh, maybe I can advance my agenda. I'll let this human go do this. Or I'll pretend to be a human to start a war. Or I'll pretend to be a human to have sex with a human. Or I'll do this or I'll do that. There's no care or concern for humans at all. They're discarded any time that they don't need them. And yet the God that they hate and the Jesus that they don't want is the only religion that says humanity has value. That humanity has purpose. That humanity has meaning. I just find that very interesting when I see that. And then uh, any similarities between Jesus' story and these stories come from the common human need for answers. I love this. C.S. Lewis um, basically came up with this. C.S. Lewis was a professor of literature. Um, He was an atheist for a a large portion of his life. And he was challenged by J.R.R. Tolkien to read the Bible and consider Christ. Tolkien was a Christian. He wrote Lord of the Rings. And uh, C.S. Lewis began to read the Bible, and here's what he said. He said, I've read poems, I've read myths, I've read all these kind of things, and this doesn't sound like any of that. In fact, what he said is that the Bible is the only myth that came true. And he became a Christian. And he would begin to argue that the commonality that we see in all the creation stories and the Savior stories and all that comes from the common human need for answers. And, and what will happen is these, these people that I've been telling you about, they'll, they'll raise that and say, oh, look, there's this commonality there, and there's this idea that we need a Savior, and so the Christianity must have borrowed from it. C.S. Lewis says, no. This is the problem of being human. We look around at the world, and we go, we don't know how the world got messed up, or why, and we don't know how to fix it. And so there's this common need that we're always looking for answers. We're looking for answers to the most difficult questions. Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? What happens after we die? How do we deal with the mess that comes into our life? And one of the things that I love that he says, he says that this common need for answers, that we're always looking for someone to save us from ourselves. You look at every... Um, known culture, and they have stories of saviors that come in. They come in and they rescue people. Why? Because we know we need to be rescued. So you have the Greek gods, you have the Roman gods, you have the Egyptian gods, you have superheroes. That's our modern day gods. You know, we have Batman, we have Superman, we have these people that have these extraordinary capabilities that are made for the right time and the right place to show up and save us from ourselves. And C.S. Lewis says, listen, the reason that it's all there is that we know we need to be saved from ourselves, but Jesus is the only one who fits that category. Jesus is the only real superhero. He's the only real God. He's the only real person that can save us from ourselves. And so when someone says, oh, yeah, there's all these similarities, you're like, yeah, there are. You're right, there are. They're bad versions of the real version. They're bad knockoffs of the real thing. Don't accept them, don't believe them, don't listen to them, but let them point you to the real one, right? So any questions? I know that's a lot tonight, but any questions or comments about that? Joel, did your last statement mean that all... All people since from the fall had essentially the same needs and knew it? In some form or fashion, yeah. Isn't the story of Jesus so much easier to believe? <laughs> yes, the story of Jesus is so much easier to believe. Like we're cracking up with the other ones. Like, I know. I know, and, and here's the thing, though, that, that's the problem. We, you know, people don't put these things together. They don't spend time to look at it. And when you start putting it together, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. And the thing that kills me that I always point out to people is, you know, yes, God does supernatural things because he's supernatural. But he never does things that are actually, like, when I read, like, what Zeus does and what Ares does and what all these other gods do, Horus and Isis and Osiris and all the Egyptian gods, like, that's craziness, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, One little verse in John 10, 10 says, 
steal, steal, and destroy. Yeah. And we need to understand Satan's who we're fighting and all these other guys are against each other. That's exactly right. It's it's a counterfeit, it's a counterfeit to the real Jesus. That's that's exactly true. And that's why we're working on this, because I don't want you to be swayed. I don't want your kids to be swayed, your grandkids to be swayed. Because you're going to, you know, if you're sending them off to school, they're watching TV, they're going to come back and tell you, hey, I saw this. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, we talked about that already. It's, you know, let me tell you, here's the reasons why it's crazy, you know. Well, well like, I guess, I guess there's a deceiver. And, and, like, and like, everything that we're going to hear here is going to try to get us to think otherwise. Yeah. And to teach our kids otherwise. And that's just was the goal from the beginning of the deceiver. Yeah. Is to deceive. And so it's still going on now in schools and colleges. Trying to teach this stuff is that Christ wasn't real. Yeah. You're right. It is. It's a game of deception. Yep. Anybody else? Tony? Um. That's a good question. He, he said, did Josephus believe that Jesus was a God? Josephus, it was a Jewish writer during the time of the Romans. And um, uh, he was hated by his people because he, you know, went over to the Roman side. He was a Jew, but he went over to the Roman side and was doing history for them. Um, I, I don't know what he personally believed, but in his writings, he would say that there are people who believed Jesus to be God. He called him the Christ. So there is some evidence outside of the Bible that people know and, and called him God. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this time that we get to spend in your word. And Father, just get to see um, truth upon truth. Be able to trust who you are and what you've done. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. No one can counterfeit him. No one can be like him. No one is better than him. And Father, may we give ourselves to him completely. May we live for him with all that we are. And may we love people enough to go and tell others about him. Can we take what we learned tonight, Father? Challenge us. Encourage us. To take what we learned about you tonight and share that with people who need to hear it. That's what we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. You're dismissed. We'll see you on Sunday morning.